I'm a treatment professional. Um, and today's topic is going to be about cannabis use disorder. Uh, I have some simple goals today, but I wanted to start out with uh, um, welcoming you. And I hope you enjoy um, our topic today. And I, I really encourage um, uh, discussion. Um, and after my slides, I really encourage any kind of questions that you might have um, that I hopefully can answer. Um, with cannabis use disorder, I, I started my uh, career, uh, my professional career in 2003 um, in an outpatient uh, slash inpatient setting with adolescents. Uh, my path to recovery started in 99. Um, so I've been in the field for a long time. Uh, I was a treatment director at a nonprofit for 10 years, uh, working primarily with uh, CUD uh, dependent youth. Um, and also life coaching, primarily transitional adult um, ages 19 to 35. Um, so my first day in treatment, I uh, got a lot of uh, experience um, in how to do an intake and meeting a person for the first time uh, to get them into treatment. But in my first year, um, primarily I worked only with uh, adolescents from the ages of 12 to 17 that had cannabis use disorder. Uh, and a lot of their use was new or it was daily, so it depended. Um, and what was a struggle for them uh, in the outpatient setting is to get them to attend on a regular basis. So a lot of that um, was really generated by um, the referral uh, process. So um, either it was law enforcement, um, school or court, um, so they were mandated to attend treatment. Um, I, I brought this uh, slide up about the recreational cannabis use um, because this is in regards to um, uh, my topic uh, is of, you know, they were mandated to be in treatment and I feel that uh, the mandated clients that were there at that time, um, they tended to uh, participate um, a little more. Um, not missing group because of a consequence wise. Um, and it's very different these days. Um, so in 2010, we had the marijuana possession became an infraction. So if you got pulled over and you had marijuana in California on your person or in your car or walking down the street, it became a total infraction. So there was no law enforcement involvement. They weren't gonna stop you. There wasn't gonna be a court date. There wasn't gonna be a prosecution for what you had. Um, and then in 2016, Prop 64 in California, this was the legalization of marijuana. Uh, so for six, six years later, um, they actually put it on the ballot and it was voted on um, and, and it became legal in uh, California to possess, buy, and smoke marijuana. Um, in 2018, the retail sales began, so we saw dispensaries pop up all over the place, both illegal and legal. And I've had the um, opportunity uh, I say to be able to tour those um, locations with local law enforcement just to kind of see how they run. Um, and it was amazing. I, I, I have to say that they have a full blown operation going on for people who um, use uh, marijuana. Um, I couldn't tell uh, in there, there were no um, actual patrons in there. It was just us. I couldn't tell, uh, you know, basically based off uh, looking at the product, uh, what, which one was sold more. Uh, but it was uh, pretty wild to be from California and to see a store that you could walk in if you're over 21 and actually purchase. Um, and then in 2020, uh, marijuana was declared an essential business during a respiratory pandemic. So some of us on the treatment side, um, educating uh, students, clients, adolescents, and young adults going through uh, cannabis withdrawal, cannabis dependence, um, PTSD, anxiety, uh, and they were still making an essential business. That was uh, that was overwhelming for the actual client and for treatment providers like myself. Um, cannabis is the primary drug of choice. Uh, you know, I'm asked often, is cannabis really a problem? Is marijuana a problem? Um, and what is the problem? What is the, the crux of the problem? What's the root of the problem? Um, and what we found, uh, you know, my uh, 18 uh, years of experience with working with clients one on one in a treatment setting um, is that sometimes it's not always the problem, but marijuana helps people cope 
with what's in front of them. So that's uh, their family situation, their environment, um, their school setting, um, their work setting. And um, when we're talking about young adults, you know, 18 to 25, um, dealing with uh, uh, relationship issues, um, dealing with the big one, which is really tough for them. The overwhelming sense or feeling of dealing with the past and uh, everything that happened. Um, so you'll hear me say this again in the presentation, you know, each client has its has their own set of um, wants and needs, and we try and meet them where they are. But they also have their own past, and we're looking at uh, the trauma that they've experienced. Um, and each person is an in, is an individual, I should say, and that means that uh, what happened to them is important to them, right? And it's dealing no matter what it was. Um, we set aside how we feel um, as the treatment provider. And we try and meet them not just where they are, but what is what is the real issue? Is is it cannabis or is it your trauma? If we take the trauma away, is there still an issue with cannabis? Um, if we take uh, the cannabis away, um, is it trauma? So we're looking at those two things, and that's the the big part about getting somebody in front of you um, that actually wants the help and has jumped over the barriers to get the treatment. So. Uh, Data shows that justice-involved youth start using marijuana around 11 or 12 years old, so that's fifth uh, and sixth grade. Um, I, I mentioned that I was a drug treatment uh, director for 10 years for an adolescent facility, and that was youth ages 12 to 17. And over a 10-year peer, period, the number one drug of choice, based off the data in San Diego County, was marijuana. So um, they were. Um, getting, using, finding ways and means to get marijuana um, and actually coming into treatment, going through the whole process of the ad admission process and identifying that they not only had an issue with use, but they were far past abuse and they were dependent on it. Um, uh, an old word that people still use is addicted. So um, the reason why I'm not using it today is I uh, use dependence because it seems to be more motivational for someone who's in treatment and they're focusing on change. And what, what seems to happen is that if you identify that possibly they're dependent on something rather than pointing a finger saying you're an addict, they seem to grow better and seem to listen more. So, you know, like I said, our goal is to meet them where they are and to provide a safe place um, and have a conversation in our education groups, and our treatment groups. Um, but having a conversation with you guys today, I, I, I really, go back to that why do people use marijuana um it's very simple my experience has been that they use it because they like the effects produced by it although they can say that possibly the effects um are problematic um, they can't at some point tell you uh, the difference between the true or the false so that means that once they become addicted or dependent they tend to fall on a lot of issues so if that's um, co-occurring issues with mental health disorders, um, if that's uh, um, simple tasks is getting up in the morning and providing like a to-do list for the day, um, leaving the house, uh, showing up to work on time, showing up for regular responsibilities. Um, and I've shared this with tons of my colleagues where we agree that a lot of the times they have a really, really hard time with uh, just functioning throughout the day. Most of the people I'm talking about are people who are daily um, users of marijuana and most of them are all day long that are suffering from it so they can't see themselves with it or without it so they're kind of in that jumping off place of what to do do I go to treatment do I change or do I stay in my same um, boat right here because it's um, it feels okay for me you know um, and as I wrote on this slide after a considerable period of time they cannot find a way out so they fall into a ditch and uh, they can't get out um, why we try and focus on not how you got in the ditch, but how you get out of the ditch is to, you know, drop a lifeline and say, maybe there's a uh, room for change. Um, and the reason, you know, the whole reason of bringing up cannabis use disorder is, um, as a problem is that it's a big one in California. Um, there is a rise in use, um, before 2020, and we've seen uh, a major rise in use of use independence after 2020. So in this last year, um, I've, I've seen um, a flood of students from um, the schools that returned um, and school administration asking for help because uh, they don't know what to do um, 
with uh, you know a group of adolescents that have been on break for a long time. You know, after the pandemic, they were they were pretty much on break for a year and a half, and then they bring them back into the classes, um, and uh, the break might have been a little too long. And I say that because they were finding ways and means to get uh, high on marijuana and or drunk on alcohol. Those are the two major drugs of choice that we see. And then the behaviors that were coming up, anxiety, nervousness, um, the pain that they endured um, with their family members that they weren't used to hanging out with. Um, so yeah, it's been, uh, uh, for the last, I would say six months, it's been very overwhelming for uh, clients to access treatment because of the barrier of um, how normalized it is to use marijuana. Um, I added this slide to talk about the rise of marijuana use. Um, it still remains illegal at the federal level, um, but a lot of states, um, including uh, California, have legalized it. Um, but we're seeing uh, individuals over 21 in retail stores, uh, obviously dispensaries and online, as well as grown at home. Not only that, but here, um, social media plays a big part. You know, Snapchat, people are connecting with people on Snapchat to have it delivered at their house. One of the biggest questions I asked, I, I ran a group last night at a high school, um, both um, uh, participants were uh, adolescents, one was 15, uh, one was 17, and I asked the 17 year old, so how did you, how was 2020 for you, but how did you access marijuana with everything shut down and you don't have a car? And he said that he knew of a guy on Snapchat that you had to be invited to his, um, I guess his message uh, system. Um, I, I don't have Snapchat, so I'm just throwing throwing out like a guess of what, what that looks like. And he said that the guy would just say, um, send an address for the location and he would meet you. Uh, and he was selling Stizzy pods, which are um, uh, marijuana pods that have anywhere from 85 to 92% THC in them. Obviously, like I said before, during a respiratory pandemic. Um, also, I want to mention uh, California issues med medical marijuana cards for uh, adults that are 18 and up. So yes, it's legal to smoke marijuana if you're 21 and up, but if you get a doctor's recommendation, not a prescription, but a recommendation from a doctor, you can take that to certain locations uh, and you can get a medical marijuana card. And that means you can actually uh, buy at the retail stores. So what is marijuana? Uh, marijuana is the psychoactive drug that contains close to 500 chemicals, including THC. So THC is the actual chemical that gets them high, the Delta-9 part. Um, what I'm going to go into discuss is uh, potency of products um, and then get into cannabis use disorder and, and what it is. So we've seen a potency increase in the year. So I'm going to go all the way back to 2000. So I started my uh, my career in, in drug treatment in 2003, but in 2000, what we've studied is from 2000 uh, to about 2007 and 8, um, there were a lot of uh, cannabis users, marijuana users, and so on and so forth of the users are dependent in California, but uh, the prevalence of use and the groups of use was, was rather, it's not as large as it is today. Um, and the potency, I didn't write this on the slide, but I want to share this because it's really important so you can compare the two. So the potency in 2000, if you knew somebody who was a um, seasoned pot smoker, somebody, excuse me, who's used for a long period of time, you could find somebody who had really strong marijuana potency up from 12 to 15 percent. Now you see on my slide, it says 22 to 33 percent. So imagine you're a first time user, it's 2000, it's 2001, you're, you're 17, you'll smoke pot for the first time. Usually if you were getting, um, you know, base, you know, average middle of the road marijuana, that potency would be anywhere from, I don't know, eight to 10%. But if you were smoking the best of the best of the best, right, and you were seasoned, probably 15%. So as you can see, um, what we're seeing right now uh, in California at the dispensaries, it's anywhere from top shelf, which is about 22, 25%, to the highest in the in the herb form, which is 33%. So if you're a first time user and you know you're going to smoke with some a group of people and you're smoking a herb that's 22%, it's so much different than it was when I first started. Um, and the point to that was is that I I am encountering a lot of adolescents and young adults, 19 to 20, I'm sorry, 19 to 25 that tend to what used to take maybe a year or a year and a half to get to dependency is happening in a shorter period of time. Why is that? Because the effects produced, they like it so much that they're starting to use every day. 
the one barrier that they have to using every day is money. So I found that that's also a trait. If they have money, it seems to be that uh, their use is increased because they can continue to re-up and continue to buy, okay? Um, now that stizzy pod that I, I um, talked about is in these oil vape pens. Total different percent, percentage as you can see, 60 to 90%. So you're talking about um, somebody who's never used, same, same pitch that I did, and the first time they use is one of these stizzy pens that are 65% THC, 90% THC. My experience with all my colleagues in prevention and education and, and uh, drug treatment is, is these oil and vape pens, it's very dangerous. What, what's going on is it's producing more of a head high rather than the body high um, that the, the green leafy herb uh, produces, right? Um, which leads to um, co-occurring disorders, which I will explain. So I had never seen anything like these vape pens in about, I would say, 2015 is when I really started seeing them on the rise. Um, and, and talking to adolescents. And I had a, a, a student in my group that said to me, you know, I don't even smoke the leafy green anymore, so I wouldn't even consider uh, myself, you know, a marijuana addict or addicted to marijuana. I would say that I'm dependent on concentrates. So he said that he doesn't even do the leafy marijuana anymore. He only smokes vape pens um, and concentrates, uh, which is dangerous because that means that, um, tolerance wise uh, and uh, what's going to do it for him over a period of time it means you're going to need more to get the same effect so um, I, I, I want to share this with you that I've heard um, only marijuana addicts and people who are dependent talk about this and it's called a tolerance break so it's where you are using so much marijuana that you build up a tolerance so high you're not getting the same effects that you did two years ago or maybe a year ago so you take a break you don't take a break from smoking marijuana, you take a break from smoking high potency marijuana and you start smoking a lower dose, um, maybe not all day, but a couple times a day, or maybe you take a break altogether for one day. And what it does is lowers the tolerance so that when you go back to the high potency, you're still getting for effect. I shared this slide um, to, to tell you that um, there are new products, but there's no testing done. And the one that I wanna focus on the most is um, Delta, well, I want, to, I want to focus on Rick Simpson oil, but I want to share about Delta-8. So Delta-8 is obviously a synthetic version of THC from hemp. And here's the sneaky, tricky part. Um, my contact Quartered Forensic Solutions, which I will have a drug test on this presentation. And they're a drug testing um, company that uh, um, an agency that I work for um, utilizes. Um, and I called them and I said, can you test for Delta-8? And they said, unfortunately, although it, it, it shows up on the first test, but there's no confirmation for the second. So they're not showing up on drug testing. So it's kind of like under the radar. It's a synthetic version of THC from hemp. They're getting some kind of buzz or high, but um, really it's because it's avoiding the actual urinalysis test. The Rick Simpson oil is, is interesting. So it comes just like it is in that picture to the far right. Okay. And, and it's, 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 it's clear, but I don't have a, a definition of what Rick Simpson treated, what cancer he treated. Um, so you, you can look Rick, Rick Simpson up and, and I'm sure you can find the cancer could have been um, some kind of skin cancer, I don't know. Um, but what he did was is he created um, you know, this potent marijuana um, based off a of solvent. Um, and it, can't, it comes in those little syringes like that and how it's, um, I, I worked with a client one-on-one -on -one that actually used it. And here's what he shared with me. He said he'd never been that high before off marijuana to the point where he felt the best he's ever felt in his life. That was the first time he did it. After the second to maybe the fifth time, he said that he got so high, you know, he was high for, you know, almost two days, right? Because it's so concentrated, 90% THC, the way that Rick Simpson um, made this oil um, and that it keeps you high for a longer period of time but it's because you're only supposed to put a little bit up on on some kind of piece of fruit maybe the size of a, of a rice right piece of rice so this gentleman um which i would describe him like a lot of dependent people that i've met is um more is better so why take two let's take four um and that attitude is across the board um what i see with people who are in that dependent stage I, i'm using for effect and let's get high and let's get high yesterday, okay? Let's get high right now. So he was telling me that he was taking little tangerine pieces and he was covering them with this. So this is not abnormal for me. I haven't heard everything in drug treatment. 
um, but I've heard a lot. So I wasn't shocked. Um, and, and, and then here's, here's why I bring Rick Simpson up is that all of these new products, once you've used it and it's gone, how do you go from getting as high as he said that you were a day and a half to going back to, uh, you know, the leafy green and, or, you know, the little stizzy uh, concentrate. Um, so it's producing, uh, you know, an interesting result. It could backfire. On it. Um, urine testing is, uh, something that we utilize in treatment, but I, I feel like it was really important to bring up a topic of uh, from 2003 um, to 2010 and what the drug testing is look like now, okay? So because of the higher potent products, what we're seeing is uh, higher testing um, results. So things that I never saw before. So urine testing, it's the matrix, the detection window, and the clinical use. So the matrix is using uh, urine, uh, it, it is the most widely used um, method for um, marijuana because it shows a, a window detection of anywhere from six to 10 days, okay? So if you take somebody who's a marijuana smoker and you can test them every six to 10 days, it's gonna paint a picture if either A, um, the marijuana is titrating in the system, means it's going down to a negative test and negative is good in regards to drug testing, or there's new use. So that's how they gauge that. It's really to hold clients accountable, okay? Um, and this is the positive results that I've seen. So we'll go to 2011. Positive result, there was an average range of about 200 to 1500 for a THC positive. And now that the concentrates are up to 60 to 90%, since 2011, I have seen, and, and the first time I saw this was about 2016, um, and I shared this in a lot of prevention groups because I had never seen it before. You were looking at a positive test of about 15,000 to 16,000. I had never seen that before. So I called the lab and I'm saying, hey, I know you're seeing these test results. So tell me, what is it? You know? And they're saying the concentrates are so high that instead of marijuana staying in the system every two to 10 days, titrating out. So the average would be about two to, to 10 days and you'd have a negative result. They say it was going as far as eight weeks. Uh, THC stores in the fatty um, cells of the body. So it releases based off um, maybe exercise or something that you do. Um, but I was, I, was, I was a little baffled that it was in the system as long as it was. But then as time went on and you know, in the last five years, what we found is, is that higher concentrated -ish products using Rick Simpson oils, um, using concentrates uh, to get the same effect that you used to get, it's gonna take a longer time for these um, drug tests to come down to negative. The goal for a negative drug test is to hold the person accountable so that when you're um, sharing with them, meeting with them, you can say, hey, you know, I gotta drug test you. And that also is not a punitive action. It's something that helps them, gets them out of these peer pressured situations and that this, that this beautiful device does. So cell phones that adolescents and young adults spend anywhere from 75% to 90% of their time on, if you go on Snapchat on, on Thanksgiving Day, you're gonna see a ton of people saying, I am getting high before I go to my parents' house or come over to this kickback party where if someone's trying to stay clean and sober, this is gonna be a big trigger for them. So I would say that the out um, that, we, that we kind of coach or teach them to do is say, you know, I would love to go, but I get randomly drug tested, man. So I got a lot to risk, um, but uh, thanks for the invite. You have to prepare them for an out because if there's not an out, they seem to um, get stuck and then it's very easy to go back. So abstinence is great when you're around uh, people like myself in a, in a controlled environment. But what happens when it's Thanksgiving day and you know everybody's got the next day off, right? It's Friday, day after Thanksgiving, and then Saturday, Sunday, and it's like, that could be a long weekend for people. So they have to have a way out, they have to have structure. And they have to have activities that are going to help them get them outside of themselves. So those healthy activities, they range from going to the gym, finding a hobby that you never thought you could do. You know, I knew a guy who said he always wanted to play an instrument. I said, pick one and go do it. And he did. He found a way out of getting outside of uh, the left and right side of his head, which is inside his own you know, mind, you know. Um, and when you smoked marijuana for five years, you have to put something in place for the next five years. Okay, the last three months, I'm sorry, the, the, the next three months have to be different than the last three months. And what I found is, is if they don't find something goals that pull, pull, pull them into the future, 
they're gonna get pulled, pulled, pulled in the back very quickly. And what's gonna happen is relapse to their drug of choice, which if it's marijuana, and then off to the races again, you know? Um, this is actually, um, I downloaded this and up and I got it for you guys. So this is a recent test. So this was collected on September the 2nd, and this donor is a male. Um, and his positive test, as you can see, it'll go to the left, 7,400. So like I said, in 2010, we never saw anything like that. What's really important to look at is that we're to the bottom where it says um, urine creatinine, 210.3 nanograms, what, and it says normal. That doesn't mean anything. Um, what we do is we look at that. Um, that that's normal. That everybody has creatinine level in their system. But the creat ratio, 35.9, this means that this gentleman, so if anybody's following me, maybe I lost you, under positive, it'll say, right below positive, it'll say um, 3599, this number right here, I don't know if you can see me doing this. This number right here means that he smokes high grade THC. 35.9 is not a normal number. 35.9, um, 35.19 uh, means that he smokes on a regular basis and he smokes really good weed. So I'm saying he probably does a lot of concentrates. A normal number I would see for THC creatinine ratio would be probably 2.5 or 3.3.8. .3 so you can see the difference, you know. And, and so this shows that this person uses daily, all day, and he's probably used for three years like that, you know. Um, so let's go to cannabis use disorder. Uh, so uh, cannabis can lead to dependence, as I've uh, stated. Uh, and research shows one in six people who start using um, the drug before age of 18 can become dependent, uh, and one in 10 adults who use the drug become dependent. So what we're trying to avoid in drug treatment facilities is to get them to see that before, from 12 to 25, the brain is still developing. And we wanna give them a chance to say, you know, maybe you don't have to start today or stop today uh, and forever, but let's do it for, you know your brain give yourself a chance to let your brain develop so that you you seem to have a go at life after 25 and i'm not saying that people who have cannabis use disorder can't make it life what i'm saying is is that um i don't want them to ruin the structure of their brain and having to deal with uh, co-occurring disorders after 25. now i can't always be there so i'm a part of that controlled uh, environment um so these are suggestions that we give that hopefully stick for the future um and I do work with a lot of people who are just new users. So these are, and I'll give you an example. Um, if you've never met anybody that smokes weed, sometimes new users, it's something that they do on the weekend. It's something they do a couple times a month. It's something that they do on occasions, right? So there's an occasion coming up, huge occasion, right? People who celebrate Halloween. This weekend in San Diego, next, and the weekend of, of, of Halloween. So for the next three weeks, there's gonna be parties from Thursday night to Sunday night for the next four weeks, right? What we see is a huge influx of admissions on the first week of November, because everybody's coming down, right? So maybe you started using, uh, you know, you're a new cannabis user, you started using at the beginning of this month, right? October, uh, you know, the weather changes, you're feeling sentimental, and you're like, man, this feels good, okay, little rain, little, you know, sun, and then they start using. Uh, and, and they go to these parties and all of a sudden the first week of November comes um, and uh, they're like, hey, I'm not supposed to be using it's during the week. You know, maybe they broke their promise to themselves or their uh, their little, um, how could you say, their schedule. So we see a lot of intakes in the first week of November and we see a lot of intakes right before um, Thanksgiving. So like Monday before the last week of, of, of November, we see a ton of intakes. And I'll tell you why. People love to clean up before they're going to see mommy and daddy so when they know that they're going to go back home or they're going to go over to grandma's house for thanksgiving and everybody's going to be there they want to clean up so they look their best they sound their best um and if not then everybody knows in the room that that person is going to be doing what they're doing whether that's marijuana or that's alcohol and some from what i've experienced they don't even show up to those um uh, actually activities or uh, family events because it's too overwhelming you know um some of the huge signs and symptoms when we get called from loved ones or if we get self-referred and i don't want to forget to tell you guys this this is huge for you to hear we meet a lot of people who come to treatment because they're referring themselves this happened because of a huge 
emotional rearrangement in their life. So either a warning from the doctor, a warning from a loved one. Now that could be a significant other. It could be a family member. It could be your 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 best friend from high school, or it could be a, a, a your boss, right? A supervisor. We meet them, and and really some of these signs and symptoms come up. Okay. What I've found is a lot of the times it's something happened that rocked their world where they had to hit the pause button and say, okay, if one of those five people are telling me that there's something going on that's abnormal, maybe I should hit the pause button and take a look. So a lot of that has to do with that nervous and being paranoid, right? Um, and their daily use or increased use or change of friends, something shocked them. So that's the first time we see that. And as you know, I'm going to say, we get a lot of calls from loved ones, people who just say, I have a son, a daughter, I have a friend, um, and something's just not right, and I need to talk to you about it. Sometimes I'm thinking that they're going to say their drug of choice is methamphetamine, heroin, alcohol abuse. So when I end up listening to the story, what's surprising, and there's a lot of similarities in the stories with other, what people like to call harder drugs, you know? And if you go down this list, this list is very similar to other hard, you know, harder drugs, you, you could say. Um, and really what we want to do is meet the loved one or the parent where they're at. How can we help you get your loved one here? So a lot of that time it has to go with listening, understanding, and providing sound suggestions, okay? Not advice, but just suggestions. Um, and our ultimate goal is if it's a self-referred, or it's from a loved one, is to somehow meet the person where they're at. So maybe that's a telephone call. It's not always one-on-one -on -one at first, right? Sometimes we're gonna talk and say, hey, is it possible for you to attend a one-on-one -on -one so that we can get down to the diagnosis of cannabis use disorder? Um, and, and, and it goes to this, is that they have to meet a criteria in order to attend outpatient drug treatment facilities or inpatient drug treatment facilities. Um, and so that we can give them the proper diagnosis so that they can get to the right station, okay? Um, so sometimes there's a long list, and, and I, I added this just so that you guys can see that here's what we're looking at when we're trying to get somebody to the right place so that they can get the help that m might be much needed, okay? Um, so you need at least two of the following of these symptoms within a 12-month period. And a 12-month period is... Um, it's, it's, this is from the DSM-5, okay? But a 12-month period is a good, you know, kind of uh, um, outlook, or you could say, but what about the person who's only been using for six months and they're already experiencing these symptoms? With the increased potency, I'm seeing a lot more of these cases where it seems to be that people are getting to um, that dependent stage or daily use or over a long period of time, meaning a year, two years, three years, faster than they were when I was working with people in the early 2000s, you know? Um, and that's overwhelming for uh, loved ones, you know? It's overwhelming for friends of these people where it's like, you know, I, you know, what's going on? I thought you just started smoking pot not too long ago, and now it's become like a habit. So habit-forming drugs like marijuana or cannabis, um, you know, everybody's different, but there's a lot of similarities with those differences. So I'll go down the list, not all of them, but I want to you know, kind of point out, uh, difficulty controlling or cutting down cannabis use, um, uh, problems at work, school, at home as a result of the use, uh, continuing to use despite uh, social relationship issues, um, and then this one's a big one, um, continuing to use cannabis despite physical or psychological problems. So you start using six months later, a year later, three years later, and all of a sudden you've developed anxiety, panic, um, depression and here's here's a here's a big thing that I want to pass to everybody here that's in the, in, the, in the group is that when someone is high on marijuana it's not when they're actually participating um, and, and they're actually high it's when they don't have it how do they react to uh, life or or I should say living life on life's terms what are what's their their what goes on when they don't have it so if you can function you can function at a high level when you're actually intoxicated with with cannabis what happens when you don't have it? So we look at both. When I say to somebody, can you stop using for 30 days? I get a lot of the same answers. Of course I can, but I don't want to stop using because there's no reason to. So if you remove it from their life and they, they, they go on a stage of abstinence for a period of time, what does that look like? Can they function 
daily without having it. Um, and and I, I think that's a big indicator uh, with the diagnosis. So not just you have to have two of those 12 or 12 month period, um, but really how do they function? Are they high functioning without it? Are they low functioning? Or are they not functioning at all? You know, and you really get to to you you know uh, get to that diagnostic part. So I've met people when you pull it away, maybe they have a couple of days where they feel a little uncomfortable, but they can they're okay. You know, my suggestion to them is, what is life going to look like if you don't smoke pot for the next ten years? What's life going to look like if you don't drink for the next ten years? Can you do that? Can you take a break one day at a time? And sometimes that's more than they can fathom, right? In that moment, it's like, well, that's that's a lot. So we try and break it down into the recovery process or the treatment process of a one day at a time, a 24 hour period of time, where for eight hours you sleep, eight hours you go to work or school and eight hours for play. So in those eight hours for play, when you don't know what to do, maybe we need to add some levels of structure to your life, okay? So this is the severity of the person's problems can be captured by um, you know, these three different uh, categories. And this comes out of the DSM-5. So mild, so that's two or three symptoms, moderate four to five of those symptoms or severe so they have six or more um, and the more could be the answer yes to all of them now I've met a lot of people who um, are in the mild state where I just say hey you know you're a user somehow you ended up in treatment or somehow somebody gave you your, me your telephone number and we do a lot of prevention uh, work with people who are in the mild or moderate maybe it's good for 365 days to not touch it and see what happens see how you react maybe and in a year you can go back to it, or maybe not. What I'm, what I, I've seen people have sheer being overwhelmed is when they have six or more of those symptoms, and they need cannabis in order to function, no matter what. You know, that's eating, sleeping, talking, engaging, and that's their whole life. So if if marijuana or cannabis engulfs their whole life, then maybe there's a dependence issue there. Um, I, I wrote that the word addiction was omitted due to the uncertain definition and its potential for negative co uh, commendation. I didn't make that up. That came from the DSM-5. Um, and I, I like that. And so I'll explain that in my groups, I talk about dependence a lot. I explain dependence so that they have an idea to say, if they were looking at a board where use, abuse, and dependence were written on there, um, they have all the tools that they need to uh, make their own decision because after they leave treatment like i say or after they leave one-on-one -on -one sessions um, they're going to have to fend for themselves you know and, and when they're not in a controlled environment so dependency has to do with a couple things so prolonged uh, cannabis use uh, can lead to dependency um, like i explained the daily use of higher potent products um, and uh, obviously using the higher potent products can lead to consuming more um, what happens when somebody's using these high potent products and they can't get high anymore, meaning they don't get the same effect? That's when I meet poly substance abuse. So I don't want to um, not forget to mention this is that I, I've met many who not just marijuana was their number drug number one drug of choice, but they they smoke weed and they do a little something else and a little something else, and all three kind of come up with this um, effect. So. Sometimes it's poly where it's three or sometimes there's just two. So they smoke weed and drink or they smoke weed and they do pills. And I feel like it's still going for the same thing. It's the desired effect. They're looking uh, to produce the effect so that they can be okay. Um, one guy shared this and, and this, is, this is priceless when he shared it. He said, you know, I get high not just because I like the effects produced my weed. He's like, I get high and drunk because I want oblivion. Because if you live the life that I lived, you'd want to get drunk and high too. And, and what's amazing about him is that he was willing to share that in a group of peers that he didn't even know, including me. He didn't know me from Adam and he was so vocal about, my past was so terrible, I have to get high in order to function today, to go to work, to come here and see you you know, people. Uh, and after here, whatever I'm gonna do, you know? Um, so, you know, like I said, everybody is, is their treatment is personalized, but it, it ranges, you know? Um, what, what was amazing, not that he shared that, it was the response that he got from his peers. Other people in the room talked about their trauma um, and it helped him with his, right? And like I said, if you remove the trauma, is there still a dependence issue? If you remove the dependence issue, is there still trauma? I think yes for both. So we got our hands full on, on the side of the fence of treatment and prevention and education um, and psychotherapy, you know? Um, so you remove the cannabis from somebody or marijuana and they, if they are in the withdrawal state or they're in that dependent state,
they're going to go through a lot. So uh, I would say that all these symptoms probably could last um, if they're just smoking the leafy green 20-30%, maybe seven days, 10 days tops. What I'm finding with people who use high to, higher pro, uh, the potent products, 16 to 90%, it could be seven to ten days, but a lot of the times it's two weeks, you know. Um, and what's the point of uh, bringing up the two weeks is that if they can make it to that fourth day, if they can make it to you know the seventh day or the second week, then they have a chance. But left to their own devices, they're going to go back to it. So they'll stay abstinent for a while, but they're going to go back to smoking because it's too overwhelming, right? Remember, they got to wake up, they got to get ready, and like I said, that eight, eight, eight. So twenty-four hour period of time. Eight hours, you got to go to work, you got to go to school, or a little bit of both, you know. You got to sleep for eight hours. Well, if you're used to smoking pot every day for the last four years, how are you sleeping? I don't know, you know. So there's a lot of ups and downs, you know, and it's going to take a lot of work on their part. Um, so what's the cause of CUD? Uh, like we brought up the, the daily use uh, in, a, in a considerable period of time. I brought up six months because that's what we're seeing these days, right? In the last six months, how many times have you used? What's that look like? In the last 12 months or in the last two to three years, I see a lot of people that are referred uh, to treatment talk about how they've been using every day for the last three years, but they've been using for the last six. So six years of total use, right? And the last three years, every day. So, you know, remove that from their life. Um, you're gonna need to help them out uh, with a lot of uh, structure. Um, but I did write, every person reacts differently but there are a lot of similarities. Um, risk factors, the high risk groups I'd say are adolescent because of the brain still developing, 12 to 25. Um, and it's known that exposure at a younger age can lead to prolonged dependency. So after they leave treatment, um, you know, uh, if they never make it to treatment, this is something where they're deep into their 20s and they're still daily using. Um, an, another fact that I, I would bring up is not everybody that's a daily user um, in their 20s still lives with their parents but a lot of them do because um, there's a lot of uh, behaviors at home that they have found a way to manipulate to um, if they're being uh, if they're being enabled um, and they're allowed to do a lot of things that maybe some of us would say, hmm, where is that coming from? It prolongs the use because they have to have money in order to you know, use and function. So. I've met a lot of parents um, in life coaching that they say, you know, I have a son or I have a daughter and here's what's going on, you know, I just can't get them out. So, or they say, I got them out, but I have them in this apartment and I give them a credit card um, and every week it's got like a two to $500 limit. And I say to you guys in this group, when I've listened to that, I said, what does someone need $500 every Monday for? So think about it, in a month's time, that's two thousand dollars. So what are they buying, right? And uh, there's a lot of things they buy, but obviously um, it, there's a lot of uh, drug use going on. So um, when I say that there's like not just a risk factor, it's not just when they're living at home with mom and dad. It's afterwards, and if they're still there in that transitional youth age, 19, and, and in California they changed this. So it used to be 19 to 25. Now it's 19 to 32. Because uh, they find that there's uh, adolescents are staying at home longer periods of time, um, all the way up until after they're 30. So, um, what does that look like for a change, right? Um, but you know, we look, we meet, like I said, clients where they are. Uh, whether I'm working on one-on-one -on -one or at their house, I'm meeting them where they are that day. How can what what can I do to help in this current situation? You know, and there's a lot of factors. Are they still using? Um, do they want to change? Where are they at in their stage of change? You know, are they considering it? Or is it just kind of like, hey man, I'm really happy you're here, but I'm only here because I have to be because I'm trying to get paid, right? Um, so I would say that the, the, the biggest risk group are adolescents going into early um, adulthood. So this is probably one of my favorite slides um, is the barriers to treatment. We've talked for a long time about what does rock bottom look like for someone who is a, a, a marijuana um, consumer, what does that look like when they say, I've been smoking for seven years and the last three, it's been every day. 
well, tell me about your life. You know, tell me about your work life. Tell me about your personal relationships. Tell me about your finances. You know, tell me about all those things. And depending on what their answer, and guess what, you guys, sometimes they have an awesome life. You know, they're they're 30 years old and you know they're they're gonna get married or they're married. They have a, a really nice job. Um, they seem to be functioning high, you know, uh, like a, at a high level. Um, so, like I said, they're wearing a different pair of glasses. They don't see that there's kind of any issue. So, um, uh, sometimes it's going to take a huge emotional rearrangement in their life. So, a warning of a doctor, um, maybe an accident, um, unfortunately, car accident, or something, something that's going to rock them to say, man, maybe I need to change what I'm doing. But I hear this all the time. Nine times out of 10, I hear, you know, marijuana is not addictive. And, you know, it's way different than heroin or methamphetamine. You would agree, right? I get them challenging me in a group with their peers or one-on-one -on -one to say, you can't argue that methamphetamines, um, you know, marijuana is worth the methamphetamine. So what I do is I try and avoid those arguments. And if you are on the call and you're working with people, here's, here's my suggestion. Um, is you simply state what you believe to be true. You show them all of the, you know, the evidence to change and you stick to that, you know, and then redirect. Sometimes it's good to redirect. Say, you know, that's that's a, that's a point. Thank you for sharing. And then sometimes you have to move on to somebody else or move on to another topic, right? Um, because they will trap you. They will manipulate you. Um, they will try and get you to agree to, you know, I don't, I don't know if they think it's a demise, but sometimes it's their own demise, you know? So like I said, my goal is to get them to a better place, you know, give them the tools they need in order to function out there to live life on life's terms, right? Um, another one, I can quit whenever I want to, but I don't want to. So I'm here for 90 days in this program, um, or my parents hired you and, uh, yeah, I'm just here meeting with you so that I can still drive my car and have my credit card and, uh, you know, my bills are paid. So what do you want to do? You know, um, uh, in the last two lack, uh, they lack the motivation to change. And this is a big one. The last one, they lack any interest in treatment. So they have no desire to go to treatment or even hear about it because they don't feel like there's any issue, you know. Um, pitfalls are people, places, and things. So these are the things that gets them in the most trouble. So therefore, not only do they lack the motivation to change, but they lack the motivation to get the treatment. And then they fall into these three categories. So they're still hanging out with the people that they've always hung out with, that have always created their own issues. They're still hanging out at those same places and they're still doing the things that they do. So until these things all change and the structure changes, it's gonna be really hard for them to see results or their loved ones to see results. And sometimes, even with cannabis use disorder, those loved ones have to detach with love. They have to let go, they have to move on. Um, so some people are going to pick, uh, I think you guys know where I'm going with this point, some people are gonna pick marijuana over those people. So they're going to get a divorce, they're gonna get, they're going to break up. They're going to move out because marijuana is more important. And I've heard people say this many times. If it's in between, I've asked them this one-on-one -on -one in a group setting. If it's in between marijuana or your boyfriend, which one are you going to pick? And I've heard people say, well, I mean, he's not really that great. So I I think I'm going to keep smoking pot because I can always find another boyfriend. And I'm like, well, that's a point, right? Maybe that's their thing, you know? Um I want to lead into, uh, in respect of time, I want to lead into co-occurring disorders. So you know, after they're diagnosed, a lot of the times we see people who do not have co-occurring disorders with marijuana, um, and sometimes we do. And these are the top four that we see. Um, I, I would focus on that. Some of you are going to see that list and see schizophrenia and say, whoa, you know, how does that make the list? But with these high potency um, products that cause more of a head high, we see them tend to um, go towards something that they never have. So I, I would say that this is onset. So this is not something that they were born with. It happened after they started smoking marijuana. Now, maybe that was after uh, three years of use or the high potency products or the mix of high potency products and other hallucinogens. I don't wanna go down the rabbit hole too far, but I feel like a lot of marijuana, not feel, my experience has been a lot of marijuana users like to experiment with other drugs, hallucinogens especially. Um, mushrooms are really huge in that uh, population. Acid is really huge. And I simply state this, be very careful with smoking marijuana, doing dabs, doing concentrates, and then ingesting mushrooms at the same time or acid at the same time, because you might produce a result 
that you can't undo, right? And I use this description. If you see this ladder, and, and if this was one of my groups that I was running, education group, I have a slide that's very similar to this. And what I've said is, is that you guys end up using that, you go over this wall, and then you get trapped and you, come, you can't come back. So what does life look like when you're on a permanent fry and you can't come back to reality? You know, and most of them, they get pretty overwhelmed, like, oh, you know, that would be a trip. You know, like if I couldn't come down and function, I don't think I'd want that. It's not a scare tactic. It's just me telling them the truth, you know, um, and I have seen it permanent damage from uh, heavy uh, cannabis use um, and poly substance abuse where the person's here, you know, they're, they're alive, but uh, they have some serious co-occurring disorders, which they need psychotherapy, medication, and a lot of wraparound services. Uh, mental health disorders, uh, daily or near daily use can cause the feelings of anxiety and paranoia. The number one complaint I hear is if you had the anxiety I had, you would smoke as much as I do. I have to be able to function through the day. So you have no idea. I have really high anxiety. I feel like my heart's going to come out of my chest. I've heard that in other groups where people are methamphetamine users, you know? So that's why I say sometimes a lot of people who are addicted to um, substances, they relate to each other and you kind of take the substance out and talk about what do you guys relate to with these co-occurring disorders and these mental health disorders? What do you guys relate to with your anxiety, your panic? And I do that so that they can own what's going on and maybe just maybe they can get the help they need. You know, I work with a client right now one-on-one. -on -one. He's heavily depressed. I go to his house on a regular basis no motivation um, to do anything uh, and he's really overwhelmed with the past and trauma that's happened to him so he'll tell you about it um, and he'll go down the list and, and share every detail to where he can remember the car that his dad drove him to when they took him to treatment when he was 15 you know and uh, that means that he literally it's it's so near to his mind and he's he's somewhat broken that that's what he has, so he holds on to it. So what I've told him is what I've already shared earlier. I said, your goals have to be so strong and so big for the future that they pull, 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 pull you into the future, or you're gonna to continue to get pulled back into the past, right? And instead of being there and being overwhelmed, what does it look like for you to be okay with what happened to you, your depression, um, your being overwhelmed? What about, um, talking about it and seeing if you can uh, get past, you know, get through it. But where I'm going with this and, and what I want to share with you is that it has to do with his willingness to want to change. Um, and sometimes you can't change depression. You can't change anxiety. You can't tell somebody, hey, man, don't feel that way. OK. Oh, you're, you have anxiety. I don't feel that. Anxiety is not normal. Sometimes it's, it's the best thing to do is just sit with them and say, OK, well, I'm here with you. We're going to have the anxiety together. Let's write out what you're feeling and how you're feeling it. Another barrier is that he's feeling that, but his solution is to continue to get high. Um, so my suggestion to him is always the more support you have, um, not just when I'm around, because I'm doing one-on-one -on -one with him, I'm, I'm life coaching him, is to go to treatment, is to see a therapist and make sure he's checking with a psychiatrist. So it's, 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 a, it's a garden variety of not just topics that are going on, but it's kind of like a pie. We all fit together. Three-legged stool, you got to have all three or it's going to wobble, right? So um, I've pitched to him and many others that the goal of treatment is to get you um, prepared um, and help you with what's currently going on in your life because sometimes their best thinking got them to treatment. Sometimes their best thinking got them to court in the, in the terrible mess that they're in, you know? So uh, why don't you try something else? And I've said this many, many, many times, you know, um, take a suggestion. Sometimes it's the best thing that would ever happen to you. And some, some people on this call, I want you to know that, that, that jails and prisons are filled with people that just couldn't take a suggestion from a loved one or a treatment provider or somebody. And, and that's not uh, too far off because um, same guy I've worked with, you know, he was high and drunk and he uh, crashed his car and he got in a lot of trouble. You know, so he was driving under the influence in California, uh, marijuana, he got a DUI, you know, which opened a lot of other doors for him to change, but it's not abnormal. So I'm going to go over some of the treatment intake assessment process. Um, I feel like it's uh, you know, important that when we're talking about CUD that we talk about treatment. So in treatment, we do uh, the referral comes in anyway, self or, 
you know, referred from law enforcement, whatever it might be. Um, and obviously there's an intake date. We're gonna cover the assessment, uh, the criteria for diagnosis, and then the group selection. There's usually two groups, intensive outpatient or outpatient services. And of course we have inpatient. The goal is not to get somebody an inpatient and then it's a, it's 21 days and you know, you're know you good and you can go. Either A, you start an, an inpatient and you transition to intensive outpatient, depending on your criteria that met and how long you've used and the things that are going on with you. You'd come three to seven times a week, or you're going to come out of inpatient, you're going to go to outpatient one to three times a week. And there's a lot of people who start in that OS, right? Outpatient services one to three times a week, and they go, you know what? I just can't stop using or drinking to go to inpatient. So we're looking at the structure of the group is every 15 minutes. So um, I share this because it used to be an hour to an hour and a half long, but really we're, we're meeting them where they need. Sometimes 30 minutes is a lot of them. Sometimes they need an hour and a half. Sometimes they need to meet with me for 45 minutes and go meet with their therapist for 30 or them for an hour and me for maybe you know 15 to kind of just check in. These are the services that are provided. We're looking at treatment groups, uh, um, education workshops, social activities. This is huge. Social activities is let's go to the haunted hotel together and we're all going to be together. So I'm going to be there. Other clients are going to be there, but we're all going to be there clean and sober and try and experience something without having to use. It's a big deal. Parent support groups are huge. Uh, sometimes uh, you don't get the parent support. And if you do, um, they're heavy. So you got to be ready. You know, if you're going to open up uh, some of those doors, you got to be ready for the support that's going to come. You know, aftercare is huge for these uh, uh, people who are participating. Um, and because I, I mentioned mental health services, there's tons of help, you know, not just an individualized therapy, um, tons of assessments that are done uh, and, and individualized. So sometimes in treatment, you're going to be utilizing more of um, mental health than you are with uh, substance use issues. But here's the best part in San Diego. We're integrated as one. We used to be separate. So when I was a director for 10 years and I met somebody that had an issue with what we what I've been sharing on this uh, you know, pitch, I had to refer them to somebody. But when someone doesn't have a car and they don't have a bus pass, I had to give them tokens to take a bus for 45 minutes to get to a therapist. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I'm going to make the leap of faith and get on the bus, right? Even if I'm struggling. So now it's in the same office. You meet with me here. Hi, how you doing? And then you go through this door and there's a therapist that's going to meet with you. So it's all on the same campus, which is great. Excuse me. We utilize evidence-based curriculum, uh, dependence, recovery issues, life skills, drug effects on the body and the mind, um, huge one, anger management, and then recovery tools. So this is uh, 12-step facilities, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, and even there's a Marijuana Anonymous. That's great. Um, and we, it, they're suggestions. So these aren't mandates for our program, they're suggestions for added support. And then trauma-informed curriculum, things that are gonna be talked about about your past to help you get through it, you know? Um, referrals we talked about, usually self um, and uh, loved ones and sometimes probation. Um, client engagement, we've, we've definitely covered that. Um, I usually say take a simple approach, you know? If, if you can only get them in one time, it's going to be overwhelming uh, if they don't come back. You're going to wonder where they are, what happened. So we really try and um, take it simple with them so that they feel like it's a welcoming place. Um, and I've talked about meet them where they are, barriers to treatment. How can we help them meet their individual needs and challenges to treatment so that they can stay? Sometimes challenges to treatment are, are more simple than we thought, you know, so more simple than I thought. Sometimes it's transportation issues. If I get a guy a bus pass for 90 days, is he going to come? He might come every day. So, you know, buy the bus pass and here he is, you know. Um, and then using trauma-informed care and, and that motivation interviewing process. So, you know, um, using different words that mean the same thing, but something that's not going to be argumentative because they're already overwhelmed. So they don't want to come in and you're in their face. This is not a behavioral modification model, nor do we do that with CUD. Um, it's not going to work, my, my experience. So um, treatment is an important part of the recovery process. I feel like hand in hand, somebody can really gain access to a one day at a time, a 24 hour segment and uh, get free. Um, sometimes treatment is a process of just starting a conversation and seeing where it goes. Uh, and time and knowledge really help. So 
you have to not only give your time, but you have to use all of your knowledge and some of your smarts to help them. And this is the biggest one out of this slide. You have to listen. You have to give them the time that they need and see where they're at. They have to begin to you know, trust you. And trust you is not going to happen in the first meeting. Sometimes trust is going to happen over several meetings or several period of time where they know, okay, this is a safe environment and I can speak openly. And this is why we use words like dependence and not addiction. Aftercare. Um, this is huge after the person has met all their goals and all their needs, where they're going to be there to um, for weekly check-in groups, wraparound services, and then that integration back to normal living. Um, I always do the suggestion, but I know that uh, I, my time is, is limited now and I want some Q&A, um, especially if you guys have any. But these are some simple suggestions. I really say a lot of the times you got to listen and put yourself in the other person's shoes. And one thing I want to share, sometimes I show up to work when I'm going to meet with some person I've met with, you know, in the last year, you know, 100 times. I remember the first day I met them and that I was eager to meet them because I had never met them before. And maybe that day, that's going to be the day that I'm going to be able to carry the torch and help them change. Um, so I, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I know... Uh, Orlando uh, said that he's going to assist, so I'm, I'm ready. Thank you for that presentation, Patrick. You're welcome. And like you said, we are open to questions now. And for anyone looking to answer, ask questions, you can do that by typing in on the right panel on the right side of the, the screen. So we'll give that some time now. This is my email. If you guys have any questions, this is my cell number. Um, I, I've already had somebody reach out to me that wants to chat. If you're still on the call, I, I, I got your uh, message uh, over email and I'm looking forward to communicating with you. Um, and at, um, um, so if you're on the call or the webinar and you have any other further questions, like I said, um, that's my personal email. Um, and that's my cell. So. It looks like there's no questions, so. Okay, Orlando, thank you very much for your time and thank you for helping me uh, um, with the technical uh, side of getting my PowerPoint up there. I appreciate it. Just a moment, and we do have a question. Okay. This person wants to know your thoughts on the 12-step programs. Oh, wow, great question. Um, uh, my thoughts on the 12-step programs. Uh, 12 step um, is amazing um, and, and not just Alcoholics Anonymous, which has been around the longest, but also Narcotics Anonymous and Marijuana Anonymous. I, I, I really, my experience has been that people that attend those um, programs and not just attend while they're in treatment, but attend and participate, um, they really get the best results. And I, I, I say this to people all the time, you got to give yourself a chance and don't leave before the miracle happens. If if you went full if you if you went full throttle with your using and or drinking, go full throttle on those twelve step programs and your life just might change forever, change for the better. So um, I would say my opinion is is that they work for people that work it. So people that go, they follow what the literature says, they get a mentor or a sponsor, and they take the steps in a row. I've heard that the steps are outlined one through 12 because they're supposed to be taken in order. So when I find that people have taken the steps, you know, they tend to get better. You know, um, the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction centers in the brain, not the body. The body's not affected until after people start drinking and using. So, you know, it's a disease, it's a brain disease. So you have to treat it as such. So people who uh, treat it as such, they get better and it's put in remission, you know, just like any other disease. So great question. I'm in Orlando. I want to say thank you to Madison if she's on the call. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I thank you very much. Okay. And uh, do you have time to answer one more question? Yeah, absolutely. I'm here. This question is Do you see a lot of dependence from medical marijuana and do you do anything differently? Oh, wow. Great question. I, I would say medical marijuana is the same as, as regular marijuana. Um, 
uh, they, they have to go to a dispensary to get it. So no, no doctor's office in San Diego, in the county of San Diego. So that's from the border of Mexico. And we call that the port of entry all the way up into about um, the borderline of Orange County, which is kind of like the gateway to Los Angeles. So we have a huge county. There's no doctor giving that medical, you know, marijuana. So with their medical marijuana card, they're going to the same dispensaries as somebody who's just going in there to buy, you know, you know, marijuana. So um, I would say that there's no difference. Um, although I have met people who have the medical marijuana card, um, who at times uh, might use, you know, a little less. But then on that same note, I've seen people abuse the card. You know, they go for a recommendation and my experience has been the recommendation can be anything. It could literally be, um, I have terrible circulation in my legs and I need a medical, I need to smoke marijuana, so I need to get a card. Um, I've heard people say my ADD is really bad and I need a card. So the suggestion can be anything. It's not a prescription though, which is important to know. So there's no doctors in this county that are giving prescriptions for marijuana. They're just writing a recommendation. Okay, and thank you for your time. You got it. For, and for everyone here, we will upload this recording on our YouTube account in a few days, and it'll be on our website too. So everyone, have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.